All right, thank you everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to today's event, Industrial Policy for Canada in a Post-COVID World. My name is Amy Zarzechny and I am an Associate Professor with the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy at our University of Regina campus. It is my pleasure to be your moderator for this afternoon's panel. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS as we like to call ourselves, is a provincial centre for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We are a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan, and we have a physical home on both campuses. Since our inception in 2007, we have become one of Canada's leading public policy schools. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that although this event is taking place online, JSGS's physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, as well as the traditional homelands of the Métis. I would also like to thank the Public Policy Forum, our co-hosts for today's event, for their assistance in bringing this lecture to fruition. To help our event run smoothly, we would ask that all participants please keep your microphones on mute and your video off during the initial uh, presentations by our panelists. You will then be invited to unmute yourself uh, and turn your video on if you wish when you would like to ask a question. In terms of the format for today's uh, presentation, each of our three panelists will make some initial introductory comments and we will then move into a question and answer period. If you have a question, please uh, notify me via the direct chat function. So again, Amy Zarzechny, Z-A-R-Z-E-C-Z-N-Y. Uh, and I will then moderate the event by inviting individuals by name to unmute yourselves and ask your question. If you would prefer that I ask the question on your behalf, please indicate that when you send it to me in the chat function. If you have any logistical questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to ask Karen Jaster LaForge uh, for assistance. And again, you can reach her via the direct chat function. That's Karen Jaster LaForge. Now, with those formalities out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our three panelists for today. First with us, we have Edward Greenspawn. He's the president and CEO of the Public Policy Forum. He's worked at the intersection of journalism and public policy for more than 30 years. And before joining the Public Policy Forum, he was a journalist with the Globe and Mail, Bloomberg News, and newspapers in Western Canada, specializing in politics, economics, foreign affairs, and business. We also have Robert Aslan, a fellow with the Public Policy Forum at the University of Toronto, uh, Monk's, and at the University of Toronto Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He previously served as Director of Policy to Canada's Finance Minister and Associate Director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. He's a former advisor to Prime Ministers Trudeau and Martin. And finally, we have Sean Spear. Sean is a fellow in residence and Prime Minister of Canada fellow at the Public Policy Forum. He's also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He previously served as a senior economic advisor to former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Thank you to all three of you for joining us today. We're looking forward to an interesting and engaging discussion, and I'm pleased to turn the floor over to you, Ed. Uh, well, thank you very much, Amy. And uh, A, I don't want anybody to misinterpret that I'm allergic to Sean. I'm sorry, I sneezed twice during his introduction. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to, uh, to be with you all today. Um, I, 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 I think in my introduction, uh, uh, there would be, I've been around a long time, so there'd be way too much to, uh, to say, but, uh, uh, you know, but I do want to um, note that, uh, that you know, I began my career in Saskatchewan and uh, I worked there for a number of years, have some friends who are on today uh, looking at names. And um, uh, I, I began, you know, my journalism career, I'm from Montreal, but I began my journalism career at, at Lloyd Minster at the Lloyd Minster Times, uh, where I learned a lot about um, heavy oil and uh, learned the word viscosity and uh and agriculture and then i was at the regina leader post at the agriculture reporter and business reporter and uh and covering politics um uh in the early 1980s and my great claim to fame um uh was they have all sorts of saskatchewan stuff around me today um my great uh, claim to fame was that when grant divine uh i went to the financial post and i was the prairie bureau chief and um I was going out with a woman in uh, in Regina and wanted to move to Regina. So I talked the financial post of moving the Prairie Bureau from Edmonton to Regina. And it was at the same time that Grant Devine was putting on a conference. He'd just been elected and he was putting on the Open for Business Conference. And he had promised to create an ungodly number of jobs, um, uh, which there was no evidence of any. So after this Open for Business Conference, um, uh, my colleagues in the media scrummed Premier Devine, 
And they said, uh, you promised hundreds of jobs and like, where are the jobs? And he pointed to me and he said, there's our first job. So um, I was known then as the job uh, for uh, for a very uh, a very long time by a group of very hostile reporters who preferred that there be none, uh, as I recall. Um, I'm here to like to do two things uh, today. One is uh, just talk a little bit about uh, the public policy format project uh, that we're working on that has to do with um, uh, the post-COVID economy and where it goes. And, uh, and then I uh, also will sort of just uh, lead into Robert and Sean's presentation on their New North Star 2 report to explain why we did their report, uh, the report and, uh, and you know, what it uh, succeeds in doing in terms of having an important national conversation. Uh, I will leave it to them to explain um, the report and their thinking be, uh, behind uh, the analytical framework of it and the recommendations of, uh, of where we should be going in the Canadian economy. Uh, and they have some um, uh, important and, uh, and original things to say, uh, to say in that report. So um, let, me, let me just uh, uh, start with the public policy form for, uh, for a minute. Public policy form uh, is a uh, think tank that's been around for about uh, uh, 35 years. It's different than most think tanks and it's mostly uh, involved with applied policy uh, type of work and it's a membership based organization. So it's got a very broad membership where we try to get people um, to get behind policies and, and across traditional lines, whether those might be sectoral or whether they may be geographic or whether they may be uh, partisan, which I'll come back to uh, in a moment, uh, whatever those lines may be. So the membership includes many federal government departments and agencies. Um, every province and territory in the country is a member of the public policy forum, including the province of Saskatchewan, which was very involved in this rebuild project that I will also talk about uh, uh, in a moment. Um, there's uh, about 60, 70, 80 corporations uh, from tech to natural resources who are involved uh, with the public policy forum, 20, 25 universities, including the uh, uh, two universities in Saskatchewan or the two uh, large ones in, uh, in Regina, Saskatchewan and Saskatoon, pardon me. Um, and uh, trade unions, uh, associations, indigenous groups, others. So there's a very broad membership and we work with them uh, toward policy solutions of, uh, of pressing problems. One of the pressing problems of the day, uh, of course, is, uh, is uh, what a post-COVID uh, situation looks like and how we, uh, how we recover from it. I think there's stages of that and we're now in, uh, in the reopening stage. Saskatchewan has been, uh, you know, quicker, was quicker to reopen than other places uh, in the country. So you were ahead on here in Ontario today and uh, you're, you know, well ahead of, uh, of Ontario and particularly Toronto uh, in that regard. But, uh, but once we reopen, we have to also, uh, um, restore growth uh, in the economy and make up for uh, lost growth. And I think that will be uh, uh, a more difficult task than, uh, than it might seem to uh, uh, certainly to restore uh, uh, all of the lost uh, output that we've, uh, we've had. And, and then there's a sort of third phase, which is the phase that we're particularly involved with which is we're gonna to have to um, figure out what a policy framework and what an economic framework looks like in this, uh, in this restored economy. Um, uh, we're looking at issues through two, for, two types of issues in, 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 in this Rebuild Canada project. One are issues that didn't exist before. And one of the main ones in those is, is a public debt uh, challenge. We really have not had uh, a public debt challenge in Canada and certainly not uh, in relation to other G7 countries. We've had a very good debt to GDP ratio um, ever since uh, uh, the late 1990s when, uh, when the deficit uh, was, uh, was taken down and the debt to GDP ratio was down, I think about 31 or 32% when this crisis um, uh, set in, it's uh, shooting up again, and that's just the federal level. And uh, the uh, 
provinces and municipalities, uh, there's uh, corporations, I mean, there's uh, households, there's uh, a lot of debt uh, uh, throughout the system and a lot of public debt, and that will impact our, uh, our policy making uh, for, uh, for long while. We will, be, uh, we will be constrained once we get past this emergency period of not caring anymore about, uh, about fiscal issues because there's, uh, there's the more pressing survival uh, uh, before we get there. And another issue that's a new issue would be you know, supply chain, sovereignty, supply chain, um, uh, uh, resiliency. You know that's not something we were really thinking about a lot, uh, a lot before this crisis began. And then there's a whole set of issues that we probably were thinking about, but we weren't thinking about enough, or their trajectory has changed uh, in uh, marked ways. Uh, one of those that's I think very important to a trading province like Saskatchewan, which has, um, I think, the distinction of Canada probably being the farthest from tidewater of any uh, of any uh, uh, province in the country. Uh, and having probably the most uh, export-oriented uh, economy, uh, nonetheless. So, you know, Saskatchewan's always been very sensitive about being able to get its product to uh, uh, to world markets. And now those world markets are very royal. There's a great deal of protectionism that was building even before uh, the situation uh, uh, that has occurred, but it's been exacerbated. You know, particularly the decoupling of China and the United States, which is a theme that uh, Sean and Robert will, uh, uh, I'm sure, speak about a little bit more in the context of, uh, of their paper. So um, these are some of the things that, you know, that, uh, that we're, we're looking at in rebuild. You know, the debt will, um, will cause intergenerational issues, it will cause interregional issues, it will, it will uh, uh, cause how are we going to distribute and pay for it over time. Um, the debt to GDP ratio has both the debt and the GDP. It has a numerator and a denominator. So we're going to have to think a lot about uh, how we grow this economy, which uh, uh, takes me to uh, um, to New North Star because uh, we won't um, we won't get the debt to GDP ratio down if we don't uh, find a way to uh, accelerate the growth of an economy that was already um, becoming more and more stagnant before the uh, uh, before the crisis hit. So um, let me use that as a, a segue to uh, Sean and Robert. Um, as uh, Amy has told you, uh, uh, Sean has a background uh, uh, advising uh, on financial and economic matters for uh, for conservative government. And uh, Robert has a background advising on financial and economic matters for liberal government. Um, the two of them wrote an op-ed together for some inexplicable reason uh, a couple of years ago. And I saw that and uh, uh, I went, wow, that is a really great thing because if there's you know, a problem that we have in this country, it's that we don't have a consensus around economic policy. And therefore, when we change governments, we just move from one direction to another direction in many of our foreign policies and economic policies. And that's uh, not good for the country. And it's not always that way. Uh, when I was Ottawa Bureau Chief of the Globe and Mail in the 1990s, we developed a consensus around um, fiscal policy. Uh, we developed a consensus around trade policy once the Liberals uh, came on board trade policy uh, under Jean Chrétien uh, after he became leader in 1990. So we, we basically had a consensus that held for, uh, for a fair bit of time, but that's broken down. So our concern at PPF was that um, was twofold. Uh, it was how was Canada going to be competitive in the global economy in a global economy, A, where we need to not change, you know, the competitiveness of the economy uh, isn't dependent on who's in power at any moment. They can bring in policies that can make that worse or better, but we need to have a competitive economy uh, regardless of who's in power. So how could we get um, a coherent view that we could build a consensus around? And how particularly can we do it given the uh, changes of the, to the economy and the most profound of the changes probably being uh, technological change and what, um, what has come to be known as the intangibles economy, an expression that uh, 
uh, Sean and Robert and I became very familiar with as they were writing New North Star One, and which is uh, very much the centerpiece of their thinking. An intangibles economy, they will explain it uh, in a few moments, but it's not the same as saying a technology, it's not tech companies. Um, uh, an intangibles economy is using uh, the tools of tech, whether that's uh, data or artificial intelligence or many different forms of or, or, or inter, uh, um, um, uh, property, intellectual property, and, and using those, whether you're using them in agriculture, whether you're, you're using them in mining or, you know, what, or forestry or whatever uh, sector uh, that may be. And that, of course, changed the nature of our economy. And therefore, we felt that it changed the terms of what is competitiveness and that was the question that we asked Sean and Robert. So how has the discussion of competitiveness been changed and how should it be changed by, uh, by the fact we now have an intangibles economy? And how can we build out a policy framework that all parties who may govern can sign on to? Gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Robert, please. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to uh, be here today. We're delighted uh, to uh, have this partnership with the University of Saskatchewan. I, I thought I could do uh, two things briefly and then uh, let Sean correct me or uh, add. And then uh, hopefully, hopefully we can have a discussion, uh, although I, you know, fully aware of the limitations of the online uh, methods that we use now, but still, uh, it'd be good to have some exchange. Um, you know, we uh, came to think about this uh, in a global framework, how Canada could uh, enhance its competitiveness, as Ed said, in, in this global environment. And so what we basically uh, uh, came to conclude very fast is there were two big structural changes in the economy that were going to affect and are going to affect and are affecting Canada as we speak that we think are very significant, very important, and that uh, policymakers need to understand, need to reflect on, and hopefully need to move on some new solutions. Uh, the first of that a uh, big structural change is um, the rise of the intangibles economy. As Ed uh, referred to, the intangibles economy is really about um, this uh, new phenomena in which economic value in the economy is derived from intangibles assets, such as data, AI, um, obviously uh, brands, uh, intellectual property, software, all the things that with uh, basically, you know, the, the computing abilities that we have now makes uh, companies, firms able to do things that they were not before uh, able to do. And also the aggregation of data, obviously, with AI that is uh, makes it for a very powerful tool in the economy. Um, when you look at the S&P 500, which is an index uh, in the US, uh, you see basically that it went from having about 15% of intangible assets in the 70s to about 90% now as we speak. Um, you look at the current market value of uh, most index, and you can see that the markets are doing well, mostly because of the big tech company that are driving uh, the markets up uh, across the across the board, really, uh, and that's been uh, the case for many years now. But I think now we're seeing more clearly. Um, so that has a significant uh, impact. We think on how we conceive competitiveness, how we conceive uh, innovation policy, because as I said, the economic value that is being created in the economy comes from a different place that we used to assume, which was more on the tangible assets. It doesn't mean that there's two economies, that there's one that is tangible or as one that is intangibles. But uh, just to give you like a concrete example that you will, I think, understand, uh, John Deere company has become very much an intangible assets company. 
why I say that? Because they use data, uh, they use AI, and they, are, they actually have autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous tractors, I guess, that drives themselves uh, with uh, intangible assets that the company has acquired over the, the years. And that makes them now, um, you know, a company that you would, you would categorize as a, as a tangible economy uh, company that is now very much an intangible uh, company uh, in a tangible world. Anyway, just to say that it intersects uh, in a very significant way. So that's the first big structural change. The second one is the US-China tech war. Uh, some have characterized it as the new tech cold war. Uh, but this big rival rivalry on the technological front that is redefining really the geopolitics of our time. And that has significant uh, consequences on global commerce, on our countries like Canada, which is a trading nation, thinks about its future and how it thinks about its national interests going forward. We used to rely, uh, we still rely to a certain extent, uh, on a rules-based multinational, multilateral, national, you know, international order that is disappearing very fast. Uh, it's disappearing because mostly this rival rivalry makes it that, uh, you know, China is not playing by the same rules as the U.S. And then the U.S. is not happy that, uh, you know, it, its crown is now in play. And so it's trying to catch up on what China is doing and then it's doing its own industrial policy. And so most countries now have to kind of realize that this world where we thought there were common rules about trade and people will get along and China will come along uh, in the 80s, uh, that has not happened, obviously, and that has major consequences for a country like Canada uh, that lives and uh, where its economy needs uh, to be export driven. And so this is why we came to the conclusion that we needed a new industrial policy because most countries react to these two trends by taking a much more nationalistic uh, approach to their own economic future. And we think Canada cannot escape this reality. Uh, now, um, in the US, you will find a broad consensus on both sides of the aisle. You know, someone like uh, AOC and even uh, Senator Warren, who are fervent, uh, you know, partisans of industrial policy. And then on the right, uh, you have people like Marco Rubio, uh, and obviously President Trump would think that industrial policy is also necessary to face off with China. Um, in the U European Union, the EU, you have this broad consensus now and the EU Commission is deploying it where uh, most uh, states, including France, Germany, are deploying industrial uh, policies to nurture their own champions. Um, and to grow their own champions because they realized, for example, that on digital uh, uh, sovereignty, they are weak because it's mostly a uh, field dominated by US and China. They don't have any capacity. And so they're bringing up these policies that uh, are uh, really trying to build their own champions. Um, even the United Kingdom, who has gone to Brexit, and you would, uh, you know, so one could argue is doing more of a, a protectionist play uh, as a, a own, their own department of industrial strategy now, which for us is, is pretty telling in terms of what they're, how they're thinking about the economy. So um, what, uh, what does uh, an industrial policy would look like for Canada, I think is, is a big question that I won't go into the details. Uh, I invite everyone to have a look at our paper, but I, I'll, I'll say a few things, a few quick, quick points, I guess, on industrial policy. The, the first one, and I think this is important for Sean and I, we spent a lot of time thinking about this, is we're not proposing uh, that suddenly Canada, the federal government, or even the provincial governments start picking winners or creating zillion of new programs with new money that did not exist before. What we're saying is essentially, it is time for Canada, uh, the governments, to be more intentional about the desired 
political outcomes, policy outcomes, uh, I should say, of uh, on economic policy. Uh, all of you probably know that we spent already quite a bit of money on these digital programs, but we're not doing it very in, in, the, in a very intentional way. And so what happened is we ended up we end up spreading the peanut butter too thin, and as a result, we don't have the desired effect on on the outcomes. The second point I'd make is that um, where we think we could really improve uh, is to be more targeted, as I said, intentional on uh, the entire innovation continuum or chain from basic research to global firms. And there are many steps in between, um, but we need to focus on all of them because uh, if we only do research well in Canada, then we won't produce the outcomes that we want. And if we only do um, some parts of business development well, but we're not getting the human capital or human intellectual capital uh, at the invention phase, then obviously we won't be able to compete either. So he needs focus on the all uh, innovation chain. Um, the third point, and for us, this is, uh, we realize a bit controversial, but we think really needed, is that Canada's been focusing, as, mo as most Western countries, on supply side policies, essentially using tax incentives, for example, like SHRED and IRAP, to incentivize company uh, to innovate. This, in our view, has more or less failed. Uh, and we need to, uh, as a result, we think, introduce more demand side policies uh, in which governments and um, private sector actors co-create markets, co-create demand by using, for example, challenges such as climate change, smart cities. Those are the one we propose in the paper or public health, which is really relevant uh, during these days. Um, an example of a demand side policy would be, for example, to use procurement, government procurement. Uh, you know, as you will know, governments spend billions on procurement every year to stimulate innovation in Canada, as opposed to just uh, you know allowing the bids just to be on the cheapest, I guess, uh, bid that uh, wins the day. We think that in some countries. Um, procurement has been really helpful to cultivate national champions, and we think this is one of exam one one example of demand side policy that could be really beneficial for Canada. Uh, finally, the last point I'll make uh, before I, you know pass down to Sean for additional comments is this intangible economy business uh, is kind of daunting and challenging, and there's no way that Canada is going to compete in this space if we don't adapt our toolkit, our policy toolkit, to uh, be competitive in this space. <clears throat> and we have advocated in both papers that we need a new data and IP strategy, intellectual property strategy, in order to um, really enable our global firms, our, our own startups, to become global firms with basically what we invent here in Canada. Um, so Canada has been doing well on the R&D level, on the public side for sure, less on the private R&D side, but uh, on the public side, we, we have a good system. What happens is we're not able to commercialize, we're not able to scale, uh, we stay small and we're just happy to sell out essentially to foreign firms, which uh, in itself is a big problem in the intangibles economy because as I said, the economic value resides in the intellectual property that you produce as a firm, as a company uh, in any sector of the economy. So we have a good foundation, which is human capital because we do immigration and PSC quite well in Canada. But um, at the other end of the continuum, I think we're struggling to be, you know, in our ability and capacity to grow global firms. And this is one of the fixed that we, we think uh, should be addressed. Uh, we're not saying it will be easy, 
but uh, certainly if we take the field of AI, for example, we're seeing a lot of buzz in Canada right now about the great public research we're doing, even the private uh, one, uh, but it's an open question whether Canada will be able to take advantage of all this great R&D and commercialize it to our advantage and grow global firms in Canada as opposed to just, I said um, earlier, just giving it out to big tech companies that already exist. Um, so on this, I'll just pass it on to, to Sean for further comments. Thank you. Any, any, can you hear me okay? I'm fine on my end, yes. Yeah, you can hear me? Great. Uh, well, let me let me be brief. First of all, thank you to the Shoy to the Johnson Shyama School uh, for uh, hosting today's discussion. We're grateful for the chance to talk about our research and and our policy recommendations. I'll be really brief um, uh, to permit uh, uh, ample time for comment. Uh, we'd be, we'd be grateful to hear your your thoughts and perspectives on our paper. Uh, there's nothing that anyone can say that's harsher than Terry Corcoran, the National Post columnist, has said about uh, said about the paper. So we've developed th uh, thick skin. Um, maybe just a couple of, of quick observations. First of all, uh, to those uh, students on the line, um, thanks for participating and and uh, uh, you're you're embarking on your career in the world of public policy at an exciting moment. Uh, the Overton window, uh, that is the 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 kind of goalposts of public policy debate are rapidly shifting. Uh, and I think uh, there's no more exciting time to be, be involved in, in the cut and thrust of policy debate. And I think our paper in a lot of ways is a, is a manifestation of that. Uh, students uh, will hear during their time in the MPP program about markets, about government uh, and conventional thinking, uh, as Ed and Robert have said, for you know, the better part of the past 30 years has tended um, to emphasize the role of markets and have a, a more limited view about uh, the, the proper role and place of government in shaping market outcomes. And I actually think by and large that consensus has, uh, was right and has served us uh, well. Um, we observe in the paper that, um, that the consensus really probably was brought to expression in the 1985 Royal Commission report uh, for those of you uh, who, who, who can remember that uh, report produced by uh, the commission that was chaired by uh, Donald McDonald, a former liberal uh, cabinet minister, a member of the Trudeau cabinet, who, uh, amongst other things, recommended that Canada pursue continental free trade with the United States and a, and a, a more ambitious program around deregulation, um, um, tax reductions in the name of economic competitiveness, um, uh, privatization, and so on. Um, and that agenda um, has, as, as has been observed, really been uh, viewed both of our major national parties for, for the better part of, of three decades. And when we embarked on our paper last year, uh, I think it's fair to say, I don't want to speak for Robert, but I thought the paper would, for all intents and purposes, affirm the basic precepts of that consensus and make recommendations around how to uh, um, you know, the application of that consensus in, 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 in new um, policy reforms. Um, and, and what we discovered is uh, that the rise of intangible assets, which have been talked about already, have unique characteristics and features um, that the previous consensus just doesn't account for. It's not to say that the ideas are wrong, it's that the ideas um, just don't have, uh, just don't have application to um, the tendencies of intangible capital towards um, um, a, a monopolistic outcomes, for instance, or the tendency of intangible assets towards zero marginal cost scaling. Um, uh, and, and so um, what started as a, what we thought is a fairly conventional look at the question of economic competitiveness um, became something much different. Uh, and in turn, our thinking around the role of markets and the role of government um, um, uh, became part of uh, become part of our analysis, and and as Robert says, um, that uh, heterodox thinking is reinforced in the second paper, uh, in in large part because um, the observation that the rise of intangible assets, on one hand, and the uh, the growing U.S.-China geopolitical rivalry on the other, which is really disrupting. 
so much of, uh, of the um, basic foundations of the global economy are actually not uh, um, um, tangential to one another. They're deeply interconnected. Um, that the, the unique characteristics and features of intangible assets is actually accelerating the geopolitical competition and technological competition between China and the United States. Uh, we use in the paper the phrase geoeconomics uh, to reflect this coming together of domestic economic policy and, uh, and um, foreign policy or, or, or um, a global economic policy. Um, there was a tendency, uh, if you were doing an MPP um, 10 or 15 years ago, to think of these two realms as separate. A, a government would have a, a domestic agenda around the economy, and then it would have a foreign policy agenda that would be independent of that. Uh, and, and I think what has is uh, what we observe in the most recent paper is that that may have been an appropriate way to think about things for a unique period after the Cold War, um, but it is not the right way to think about economic policy uh, in this new context. Uh, and so, uh, as Robert says, um, the new North Star II uh, sets out a, a different way of thinking about um, Canada's economic policy framework. The, the relationship between markets on one hand and the government on the other um, are reconceptualized in a way that, 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 um, that reduces the, the, the compartmentalization that was really at the heart of the uh, McDonald Commission's ethos and, and the public policy consensus that has shaped um, economic policy under both liberal and conservative governments at the national level. And you know, so in a nutshell, what we're proposing is Robert observes is a, a, a different role for government, not one that um, supplants markets um, or, or manages markets, but one that recognizes that government policy has a, a unique place in shaping market outcomes. Um, and, uh, and that recognizes that there are certain market outcomes um, that are in the national interest and we, that we shouldn't be afraid to use government, to use policy levers to help to cultivate technologies and firms um, that can scale and ultimately um, compete globally and participate in global supply chains. Uh, on, on one hand, um, that may sound um, uncontroversial, um, but on the other hand, um, the extent to which it challenges some of the basic assumptions of, of the consensus that has marked uh, Canada's economic policy framework, um, it is unique and different. Um, and what's interesting, Amy and, and, and others, is that we, we started this paper um, back, I guess, in um, the late fall of uh, 2019. Uh, and we, were, uh, we conducted uh, consultations across the country with business leaders, un uh, labor leaders, academics, and others. And I think it's fair to say that uh, Robert's thinking, my thinking, Ed's thinking, we're starting to recognize that, um, that there that there, there did need to be a, a rethink of Canada's economic policy um, framework, a, a, a recognition of the, the role and place for a industrial strategy. Uh, and then COVID hit. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen firsthand, um, um, you know, the limits of, of deferring to markets um, questions that are of uh, strategic or national importance. You know, one thing I like to say when I talk about the paper, the fact that, um, you know, north of 50% of Canada's um, personal protective equipment come, comes from China, and we discovered the fragility of that source at the height of the crisis, isn't a case of markets functioning. That's a case of markets doing precisely what markets do, which is allocating resources in the most efficient way. And we've seen now governments across the intellectual and, and political spectrum say, well, wait a second. Um, we want to place new parameters on markets um, because there is something that uh, trumps efficiency. In this case, um, stable and secure supply of personal protective equipment. Uh, in some of the other work that I've done with the Public Policy Forum, we've observed similarly that markets are um, agglomerating in major urban centers. Uh, and that's the tendency of markets to, to allocate resources efficiently. And I think it's entirely reasonable for politics for society to say, well, wait a second, we want to place different set of parameters around markets because we don't like those outcomes. We would like economic activity and investment to be uh, more broadly distributed between um, cities and rural or remote uh, or economically distressed parts of, of the country. So all of this to say, I mean, if there's kind of one basic idea that I think 
I'd like to leave with the group, particularly those students who will be tackling these issues um, beginning in the fall, is uh, the paper recognizes the allocative efficiency of markets. Um, there are so many reasons why markets um, produce better outcomes than government. Um, but in light of the trends that Robert and, and Ed have described, uh, the rise of intangible capital and the geopolitical and technological rivalry between the US and China, which is disrupting the foundations of the, of the global economy, I think uh, I've come to the conclusion that Canada does need an industrial strategy um, that focuses on our national interests, that focuses on cultivating technologies and firms um, that can scale and uh, ultimately um, compete in and participate in uh, the, the global economy. Uh, and so maybe with that, Amy, I'll just, I'll just stop. Um, I know we've, uh, we've, um, we've sort of overloaded those who are, are here with us and we would be welcome to hear their uh, questions and, and comments about the paper and, 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 and its, um, its, its analysis. Well, terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you to all three of you for your very interesting and insightful comments. I think it's a great start. Um, I am starting to get some questions in through the chat, which is fantastic. So I would invite everyone again, if you do have uh, questions or points you'd like to raise for discussion, please send them to me through the chat function. Again, it's Amy Zarazechny and I will uh, go through them in turn and invite you to either ask them directly yourself if you'd like to unmute yourself or you can indicate when you send it to me that you'd prefer to meet, read me to read it out on your behalf and I will be happy to do so. Um, so I have one question uh, now. Uh, it's from Dale. Would you like to ask that directly, Dale? I'm happy to pass the floor to you. No, you can go ahead, Amy. Sure. Go. So the question is, uh, so the observation perhaps first, that Saskatchewan is a natural resource or commodities export economy, and uh, your thoughts on how that changes in an intangible economy, or whether it, it in fact does. Uh, well, maybe I'll start. Uh, uh, one observation that Robert made, which I, which is, which can't be reinforced en enough, uh, Dale, is that um, that uh, it's a false choice to think about the old and the new. Uh, in fact, um, the uh, the uh, advisory council to Minister Morneau, um, in which uh, uh, Robert was is involved, that was chaired by our now ambassador to China, Dominic Barton, observed. Um, that it was agri-food, uh, agriculture, and, and, um, and natural resources where Canada had um, a pre-existing competitive advantage uh, around the world. And the way to um, leverage that advantage is actually to incorporate um, intangible capital into the traditional business model. And, and we're seeing that. Uh, um, you know, I hate to use anecdotes, but my father-in-law is the head of the uh, Canadian Can uh, Canola uh, Council. Uh, and um, this is a great example of uh, a traditional, a so-called traditional sector leveraging technology um, to achieve significant global market share. Uh, if you step back and look at our economy, canola uh, is highly innovative, um, and um, and it is now uh, a, 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 an area where Canada is the dominant global player. Um, and so I think they'll. Uh, uh, Saskatchewan, that you know, what will drive uh, wealth and opportunity in Saskatchewan in the future will be not be um, changing the face, you know, changing the sectors that are driving the economy, but rather the adoption and application of technology to those um, to those sectors that um, that contribute to higher levels of productivity uh, and ultimately um, higher levels of uh, of of wealth and, and opportunity for the province. Yeah. Can I just follow, could I follow up on that just for a second? So, Sean, I hear you. I, I'm just wondering, can you give, and canola is an example, but, but I'm just thinking going forward, right? The intangibles economy, Saskatchewan exports raw, uh, uh, raw commodities for the most, uh, raw resources, potash, oil, uranium, these sorts of things. Now, are you saying, you know, apply technology in terms of improving the productivity uh, of, of those sectors? Uh, or like, I'm just not entirely sure what you're saying about, you know, how the economy adapts to it or takes advantage of the intangibles economy. Roberto, are you gonna say something? Yeah, sure. I mean, from my point of view, uh, Dale, it's a great question. 
Uh, how will companies use data, for example, in AI to be more productive? I, I do think it's a productivity question, an efficiency question. Whether you're a, a company in the oil sands in Alberta or you're um, you know, a, a company that ship grains from Saskatchewan, I think these tools will be necessary to be competitive in the global marketplace. And so this is how uh, I think that uh, the intangible assets become very important. Um, you know, you have Suncor in Alberta who just signed a huge partnership agreement with Microsoft, basically using their software, their AI capacity to make their operation more efficient, more productive. Um, and that's obviously a trend we've seen in the economy. It's actually the drama of um, you know, the, uh, the holding out of the middle class, which is to say that industrial jobs have been uh, lost in a, in a great way because of automation and technological change. Uh, but for firms, this is where the future is. They have no choice but to take this turn and create these engineering jobs and these uh, data policy jobs that will be necessary in these companies. Um, I, I, I would just uh, add something to that, Dale, as well. I, I, I think that it happens in two ways. Uh, and I think part of the argument that Robert and Sean make is that it happens uh, too accidentally, that it doesn't happen. What is the word you guys use uh, a lot? With in intent, with intentionality, right? Or something of that sort. Um, and the two ways that it happens is that, you know, we, uh, we take our products and our commodities and we make them more competitive through intangibles and put them out on the world market in uh, uh, greater productivity, as Robert says, um, uh, a more competitive uh, product. Also, we're creating at the same time new products and new pathways to products. Uh, we're creating, you know, Dale, we've had discussions about, um, about carbon and carbon uh, fibers and carbon as, as, as a product and, and separating hydrocarbons into hydrogen and carbon and extracting value out of, uh, out, of, out of both of those. And then extracting value out of the technologies that, that we um, become good at in the process. So I think the intangibles piece, um, you know, both goes directly on the product, but it creates spin-offs uh, potentials. And and the question is, how do we, you know, the question that Robert and Sean, and maybe they want to come back in on this, address very, uh, very much is, you know, we have a series of programs, but we don't have a policy. Great, thank you. I have a question from Roger Petri, and I'd like to invite you to unmute yourself and ask if you like. Hi, um, so uh, I have a question about uh, the role of the sharing economy and the role of open licensing. Uh, it seems to me that your model presupposes a standard commercialization model where the knowledge is effectively privatized as a kind of competitive advantage. And we also know that that's actually in a very inefficient in terms of creating monopolies that are costly to everybody. Uh, I didn't hear anything about open licensing and the sharing economy and it's kind of surprises me because it seems to me the backbone of our innovation in Canada are either public institutions or universities, both of which are very much embraced in that paradigm of knowledge. And secondly, I didn't hear anything about the voluntary sector or the nonprofit sector and the role of volunteerism in terms of mobilizing people's energies, which again requires free and open systems. And so I was kind of wondering, given that a, a lot of people are going to be out of work, a lot of time on their hands with COVID, uh, we can't expect things to come back. There seems to be a real opening for mobilizing human capital in these new ways, specifically in terms of localization of production, but also in terms of embracing the broader ethical global ideals around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And again, I didn't hear anything about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, does any of that play a role in your modeling of a, of a path for Canada, especially for a place like Saskatchewan, where we've never really effectively industrialized and, and we're so far from port 
And it seems to me moving into a, a broad <laughs> open sharing economy and sharing, and particularly sharing capital. So it's not firm based, but it's communities mobilizing their physical capital for multiple firms and multiple groups. Any, any of that to your strategy? It's a very uh, interesting question. Thank you. Um, the, 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 the specific thing that is kind of central to our thesis that I didn't spend time on uh, explaining is the idea of mixing industrial policy or using challenges as a, as a vector for industrial policy. And by challenges, we mean essentially social challenges such as climate change, public health, how do we, uh, you know, use the economy to better communicate and uh, have better mobility for people with, that are disabled, for example, that kind of stuff, uh, so that it intersects with effectively what you're saying, which is more of a social priority nexus. Um, and frankly, if the government doesn't direct the economy that way to produce these things, it won't happen on its own, right? We've seen history showing uh, that specifically, you know, when John Kennedy said, I'm going to send a man to the moon, then it produces effects in the industry that people start building stuff that are enable us to go to the moon. And the same principle would be true, we think, with climate change and public health and all the kind of social goals that we have as, as a society, but also not just goals, problems, challenges that are real and are affecting our communities and our cities. Um, so that's one important part. I, I'm, I'm intrigued on your, to be honest, on your open license comment. Uh, I know that um, I, I work in tech, so uh, I'm more uh, versed into patents than open licenses, but uh, uh, and, pa and patents obviously are proprietaries and are not uh, shared most of the time. That's kind of the idea of a patent. But I know that uh, I said the uh, innovation department in Ottawa has worked on uh, a patent collective in which we could pool. Uh, basically, it's more or less what you're saying about open licenses. You can pool uh, the stuff that was created in Canada by researchers or universities and share it with small, medium enterprises that could then grow out of that knowledge. Uh, so that I think would be very effective in the, te in the technological sense that um, SMEs obviously won't have the technology that Google has, so they have to start somewhere. Amy, may I just make two quick observations in response to Roger's uh, question? The yeah. first is, um, Robert mentioned our thinking around using missions or challenges as the um, basis of an industrial strategy. Um, that's just not because we're nice guys. Um, uh, that's because we spent a lot of time thinking about uh, how you make judgments about how to orient or where to orient an industrial strategy. Um, uh, the literature tells us that where industrial policy has failed, it's where it's when industrial policies have become uh, politicized um, and or based on um, uh, based on um, uh, assumptions that uh, that don't hold up to like empirical tests. Uh, you, you know, uh, providing uh, f uh, direct federal or government support to um, uh, companies that have you know special relationships with the government and so on. And so as we thought about how to minimize the risk of distortions, inefficiencies, and rent, think, rent seeking, in effect, to try to minimize the extent to which government is um, picking so-called winners and losers, uh, we became persuaded um, that the right way to do that is not to say, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna target this sector or this particular firm. Instead, we said, we'll target this particular public challenge, and in so doing, um, galvanize industry to uh, to come up, you know, to be innovative in in the pursuit of that particular um, social objective. In and so, in effect, the benefit is twofold. One, hopefully, we make progress on a pressing social question, uh, and two, we get the knowledge spillovers um, that flow from a, a challenge a challenge based model. Um, so that that was really um, that, that that that's a. a was something that we, 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 we thought a lot about. The second point um, that both Roger and, and Robert touched on is 
um, the, the role of uh, public R&D um, and the intellectual um, property framework that governs how public R&D is, is used, um, how it's leveraged, how it's ultimately commercialized. I think, Roger, this is a sleeper issue. Uh, well, it is, um, well, it is um, the, you know, the subject of great debate um, uh, within the halls of universities and so on. I don't think it's quite reached the consciousness of our political class, uh, um, but I think it needs to. Uh, we were on a discussion earlier today with the university president, um, and there are real questions about, um, uh, 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 about uh, how to leverage um, public R&D in the interest of, of, of the national economy. Um, there's been such an emphasis on tech transfer that I think a lot of post-secondary institutions have responded by um, partnering with whoever will take the R&D and, and, and the intellectual property in the name of commercialization. Uh, and now policymakers are saying, wait a second, we don't want you to partner with anyone. We want you to partner with particular firms. And a lot of the post-secondary institutions are saying, what the hell, just tell us what you want to do. Um, and and um, so I, I do think um, there is a legitimate debate to be had about um, the policy framework around intellectual property with respect to public R&D, just to be concrete rather than to talk in, in the abstract. Uh, Israel um, has a policy presently um, that uh, in instances where an Israeli firm that has benefited from the public R&D sy system is acquired by a foreign firm, um, the public subsidies have to be repaid to the government unless the, the foreign firm that's acquired the, the domestic firm maintains um, that intellectual property and the associated R&D and production within Israel. Um, that was something that came up in, in several of our consultations, should Canada have a similar policy framework um, that would in effect say um, public R&D is in the interest of Canada, um, the positive externality, the whole premise is that it produces positive externalities here within our borders. And if it's snapped up and acquired and taken elsewhere, the whole premise of the public R&D is, is diminished because the positive externalities are now being um, drawn upon somewhere else. I, I, I really think that is a, a sleeper issue um, that uh, policymakers are going to have to figure out um, um, given um, the critical work that's being done in our post-secondary institutions. Great, thank you very much. I have a question from JSGS colleague Ken Coates who asks, every country in the world is having similar discussions. Canada historically responds slowly in a limited fashion and with less effective business engagement. What are Canada's realistic chances of being successful, particularly in areas of high employment? First of all, let me say hi, Ken. I didn't know you were here. Uh, Ken's a, a good friend and, and, and a, a real treasurer at the uh, Johnson Shannon School. I think that's Ken's observation is an important one. Um, the, the first part in particular, where he talks about the conversations that are going on. And this speaks to the my point about the Overton window and why it's so exciting to be in the world of public policy these days. Um, if you would have told me six months ago that there would be uh, growing um, support for industrial policy amongst American conservatives, um, you know, people who grew up on a diet of, of Reagan, uh, of Ronald Reagan, I would have said you were crazy. Um, but just last, uh, but just this most recent winter, um, a major conference in Washington um, that was attended by um, many high profile conservative thinkers and writers and academics endorsed uh, the resolution that uh, America needs an industrial policy in light of um, the trends towards intangible assets and the growing geopolitical and technological rivalry with, um, with China. And so in some ways, um, I think the cake is sort of baked here. I, I think it's inevitable that we're going to see uh, a, a more nationally focused industrial policy in the United States, irrespective of who wins the election. As Robert said, we're seeing um, the EU announce a major recovery fund with a focus on cultivating um, um, European firms and technologies. Um, the, the Brits are talking about this, the Australians. The Japanese have actually announced a $2 billion fund in the name of um, reshoring um, parts of supply chains. So you know, increasingly, I think Canadian policymakers have no choice. We can't afford to be out of this game. Uh, and, and so the question, it seems to me, is no longer should we have an industrial policy, it's how do we design one that minimizes the distortions and risks uh, and inefficiencies that have typically been associated with 
a, a, a more activist role for government and the economy. I don't want to diminish those uh, those challenges. They're ones that I've agonized over, but I think um, I, I think there is a, a way for government to uh, to uh, support domestic technologies and minimize those distortions. If I can just give you one concrete example, um, Robert can't. Uh, Robert would be uh, uh, apprehensive about raising this, so let me raise it on his behalf. Um, just in the past week or so, um, those participating probably saw that Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Doug Ford in Ontario announced uh, a new contract tracing partnership with BlackBerry and, and Shopify, two of Canada's most um, dynamic and innovative firms. Um, so they are in effect ha um, providing a direct contract to these two firms uh, to cultivate this new technology and capacity that will not only serve Canadian interests here, um, but will hopefully become um, um, capacities that these two domestic firms can export to other parts of the country or other parts of the world rather. So here's an example um, you know, that I don't think offends market principles. The government was going to um, pursue contract tracing um, no, no, no matter whether it ultimately selected a Canadian firm. The only question was whether it was gonna be our domestic champions, BlackBerry and Shopify providing the service, or whether we're going to outsource it to Google. Um, and so I think these are, you know, the, 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 the underlying premise of that arrangement with BlackBerry and Shopify, I think ought to become a, a part of the way the government supports innovation and uh, the cultivation of Canadian technologies um, um, more generally. If I could just make one final point, because I know this is near and dear to Ken's heart and is to mine as well which is um, um, the urban-rural divide um, and, and how, you know, what's the role of public policy um, to try to push or prod capital um, that presently is uh, um, uh, concentrate, increasingly concentrated in urban centers um, to rural or economically distressed parts of the country. The numbers are really staggering. Um, um, in 2019, uh, north of three quarters of all net new jobs were created in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Uh, in this country. So th this is a good example of the market uh, uh, allocating re uh, resources in an efficient way, but a way that we may not like as a society. Uh, and I, I do think that, there, that part of an industrial policy is, yes, of course, trying to maximize productivity in these parts of the economy where we think we have a pre-existing comparative advantage. But for me, um, uh, another aspect, a secondary priority uh, is trying to um, push the market uh, to spread investment and opportunity um, uh, um, more evenly across the country so that we don't have the, the, the geographical inequality um, that, um, that I think can ultimately be the source of great political unrest. Great, thank you. I have another question um, from uh, Manus Mehta. What role does Canada's financial sector play in Canada's industrial policy given its risk averse nature as compared to Silicon Valley venture capitalists? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would answer by uh, with two elements, I guess. Uh, first is, um, as most of you, I guess, uh, know, uh, we have a financial sector that is uh, highly regulated and also protected from foreign competitions. That in itself doesn't make it the most innovative uh, sector in the economy. Uh, that's by design. And uh, there are other purposes like uh, financial stab stability. Uh, you know, I haven't been in the finance department dealing with um, issues uh, in a financial sector. I think there's some great strength of having a, a concentrated financial sector, but also on the innovation side, uh, uh, lots of uh, downside. Um, I, I actually have a, a friend uh, who is a CEO of a startup in the fintech uh, business. And I know that he's struggling a great deal to get his business uh, growing and scaling because he finds that uh, in Canada, uh, in that sector, it is very difficult to bring up new products and is is really based on on data um, and aggregation of data but uh, he finds it very hard to to scale and uh, although he's successful he's not able to do uh, to grow as fast as he would like so uh, 
you know, the, ends, the, the solutions are not easy, to be honest. Uh, I don't think the government, any government uh, on both sides of the aisle would be ready to deregulate the financial sector to make it more agile and, and innovative. Uh, uh, but certainly on the capital side, I think that um, there's a huge challenge on the late stage capital or long-term capital financing of our, uh, you know, uh, startup and uh, more venture uh, business side of things. Uh, we have tools like the BDC and EDC who do financing and they do pretty good, uh, but to a certain degree, you know, to create a global champion, you really need to chip in and do more than a few hundred thousands and a few uh, millions. So there, I think the banks could be a bit more aggressive uh, with the capital and helping financing some of, you know, uh, where there's more risk associated with uh, emerging technologies, for example. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Tracy Campbell and it is, what does the panel suggest for training and employment investments? Sean is an expert in that. Well, I don't know if I'd call myself an expert. Um, but um, as Rivera said, I think, um, I think uh, human capital is a strength for Canada. Um, you know, I'd like to say that um, we've managed to achieve something that very few jurisdictions have. We have relatively high public support for relatively high levels of immigration. Um, and that's obviously an asset um, that we need to protect and, and, and cultivate. Um, you know, part, one of the, the items that the, the paper observes um, is schools like the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan do such a tremendous job attracting international students. Um, um, but our track record as a country on international student retention uh, is mixed. Um, there are some successful models out there. Uh, the PPF just hosted, I guess about 10 days ago or so, um, a similar type of event on um, the experience in Atlantic Canada where the study and stay program does seem to be producing some positive results with respect to international student retention. Um, so, you know, I think that's, um, you know, that, that, that'll be important. It's one thing to attract students and it's, an, it's another thing to retain them and we need to think uh, strategically about that. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have um, a, a, a a silver bullet for Tracy. I think, I think our, uh, the, the research tells us that our experience and record on various forms of skills training, particular, particularly mid-career models, uh, is similarly mixed. Uh, the Public Policy Forum just last week um, published a paper by uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta, who at, um, previously was the president and CEO of MyTax, which no doubt is on the University of Virginia and University of Saskatchewan campuses. He's now running a new nonprofit called Pallet, uh, which is seeking to match um, people who've been laid off um, in um, industries that are subject to creative destruction with um, the parts of the economy that are growing in, and are in demand, um, or pardon me, have great demands for workers. Um, you know, so that, that, that um, uh, may be one model worth pursuing. I think more generally, um, you know, our efforts to uh, um, support post-secondary and, and, um, and other forms of education uh, are important. Uh, um, you know, our record on, um, our record on, um, on post-secondary is positive. Um, but uh, we still have amongst the highest gap between post-secondary attainment between urban and rural parts of the country. And we still have uh, six and a half or so million Canadians uh, who have, um, who, who don't pursue any form of post-secondary. It seems to me, um, it seems to me if we can help some of those people um, pursue different forms of education, including but not limited to apprenticeship and, and other uh, skilled trade certificates, we can significantly boost their, their human capital. Uh, I'm sorry, Tracy, I apologize if that's not, um, um, you know, one of the things that I've kind of taken away um, in Ontario, at least, is we're doing a lot of things in the world of um, 
skills training, um, but the, the 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 record is still um, at best unclear and at worst a, a, a work in progress. Thank you. I have a question from uh, Louis, and I would invite you to unmute and ask it yourself if you wish. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, actually, uh, I, it's my, my, my question is, is based on, I think there is some problem now in all the, what is, what is happening now on the policy level. It's like copy-paste, almost all countries that are doing the same. And some of the policy issues is also uh, uh, based on the, uh, uh, let's say, political now. Everybody is, they want, they don't want to, to do something not uh, politically well accepted or not very popular. So mm -hmm. the problem with the policy issues that is happening, and I think this is a major issue about the structure here, if we, because at the beginning you mentioned China and, uh, and USA. Both of them, they have totally different structure, but bo both of them are very competitive. And now if we, we, we take the case of Canada, or we, we, I think this is other places. If, if you go to UK, they did the, the re-exit because of two of things, which is like uh, the NHS, the National Health Service, which is people, they vote because that, uh, that's uh, touched their daily issues. And the second one is because the part-time jobs, which like also people, they cannot find proper part-time jobs. I think if, if you want to work policy now with political opinion, you have to have some one higher level that will be agreed between all parties and to be agreed on national level before you go into how you approach or how you implement. And that's also is mentioned by Roger's comment is about this, the sustainable development objectives. Sustainable development is very, very wide uh, 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 guideline, how you can do development how you can contribute for things which might not be very politically uh, appealing, and how can we have agreement on, on, the, on the national level? Amy, may I, may I respond to that question? We actually had a similar question in a session we did this morning, um, and it's obviously a highly relevant one, um, especially since the, the type of industrial strategy that we're talking about uh, is not going to produce um, a fundamental results overnight. It's going to require sustained support that may um, cross election cycles. It may across different governments. And as Ed had said in his remarks, the risk, of course, is that a new government comes in and, and scuppers what, what's happened in the past um, because it was advanced by its opponent. And we start all over again. There's also the risk that uh, the types of industrial policies that we're talking about are going to produce um, the occasional mistake. Uh, and those mistakes tend to be higher profile than their successes. Um, you know, we don't remember uh, any of the successes from the Obama administration's clean energy uh, uh, innovation programs, but we all know um, their failures. Uh, I, we all know about Salandra. And so how in, a, um, how in the political context are we able to make progress on, um, on industrial strategy? I think the, um, the, the, the two responses I would give, recognizing that they are, um, you know, that they may ultimately be unsatisfactory, is the first, uh, Robert and I have proposed to root the industrial policy in a set of uh, social priorities or public priorities that uh, have cross-party support. Every party is committed to Canada's Paris targets. The only question now is how do we go about achieving them? Every country, every party rather, is committed to um, Canada's public health system. The question is, how do we best execute on that? And so by rooting uh, our industrial policy in a set of priorities that uh, are broadly shared by the major parties, you hope to minimize the disruption um, between election cycles. Uh, the second point I would make, um, um, and this is, this, is, um, this is not necessarily empirical, this is my, um, this is my assessment of the political landscape in Canada. I actually think um, that uh, the Canadian public would respond positively to an ambitious message about uh, cultivating national champions that can compete and win on the global stage. Our politics have become um, uh, transactional in recent election cycles. Um, uh, there's been a, a, a focus mostly 
on uh, questions of redistribution and less of a focus on questions of productivity, um, uh, economic efficiency, and so on. And I, I actually think that the, in the current moment we find ourselves in, particularly um, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis and a recognition of the importance of national interests, I, I think uh, the Canada's political class would find a message about an ambitious national interest driven strategy for Canada, uh, one that has uh, resonance in the, in, the, in the Canadian public. Um, but uh, but and, um, that in no way diminishes um, the point that you make. It's one thing to have support for the framework. Um, uh, inevitably, um, you know, the political issues will emerge on individual choices or individual failures. And all I can say is that by articulating the framework, articulating the vision, articulating the, um, the, the, the path um, that the government is charting, hopefully um, they, it can bring Canadians along so that at, at individual junctures, people understand um, the, the broader vision. I think it's that vision um, that we're presently lacking uh, and one that we're trying to build support for in our work. Thank you. I have a question from Tosin. Uh, how would industrial policy influence enterprises in the free trade zone, most especially small and medium-sized enterprises? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're moving, uh, and that's obvious thanks to anyone who is following uh, basically what's happening in the U.S., but we're, we're essentially moving from a free trade era, which had a few exceptions for sure, uh, to a managed trade era where the United States, but most countries take a very, take a very uh, nationalistic protect, protectionism uh, approach uh, to their own sectors and their own industries. Uh, so it's going to get very tricky for Canada. I mean, Donald Trump is set to renew the tariffs on uh, steel for Canada on the basis of national security. I mean, who would have thought that only um, a few years ago that a president of the United States would invoke national security to his best trading ally, uh, the longest unprotected border in the history of, of the world. Uh, you know, they have uh, an apparatus now, uh, CFIUS, uh, that is screening all the investments coming from elsewhere to the US, including Canada. Uh, and obviously, although it's mainly targeted at China, every country uh, has to conform uh, to it. So th the short answer is going to be very tricky. And unfortunately, uh, international uh, bodies such as WTO has lost a lot of its own legitimacy because of uh, the U.S. attitude vis-a-vis -vis it, but also the sentiment that most countries have that the, there's not a level playing field that China has basically bulldozer us and has won uh, and conquer uh, most markets, including by using, uh, and I'm not making a judgment whether it is false uh, or true, but certainly in the literature uh, on you know currency manipulation and on dumping. Um, so, um, it puts us in a very difficult situation where uh, you have no certainty, essentially, at least on a rules-based uh, you know, framework that uh, you'll be successful. That being said, I think you know, Canada will remain a trading nation. We will be able to be successful uh, and companies, I think, will thrive. Uh, but we're going through a, a rough period for sure. Um. I just, if I could weigh in on the trade issue, because of the Rebuild Canada project where, uh, you know, this is a very key issue. Obviously, Canada's very dependent on uh, on world markets and exports, and our biggest market, as uh, Vera points out, has been uh, increasingly arbitrary in its, uh, in its actions uh, toward us. Uh, it used to be that the softwood lumber was the exception to the rule. And now uh, that kind of uh, managed marketing, uh, managed trade seems to be the rule. And our fastest growing market, which has been China, 
uh, has also been arbitrary and um, arbitrary to us economically and, uh, and cruel and unusual in its uh, treatment of, uh, of two of our nationals. Uh, so that's, um, those aren't reliable markets for us uh, uh, anymore, which poses a, a huge problem. I, and I saw a statistic last week that sort of um, uh, blew my mind a little bit from the Export Development Corporation that showed that on the trends that we were heading with the United States trade and Chinese trade, actually China would have become our larger export market in only 26.3 years, which really in the realm of policy change and trade change uh, isn't that long at all. It's um, less time than since the free trade agreement or, or, or the NAFTA agreement. Um, so we're going to have to you know, figure out both how we manage the United States, that's uh, more protectionist and more inward. Uh, we don't really have much of a policy toward, uh, uh, toward China. It's a difficult time to talk about uh, a policy uh, uh, toward China. The policy toward China means also you know, protecting our sovereignty against uh, incursions uh, in our sovereignty, protecting our national security, uh, but, but trading. And clearly we have two agreements out in the world that are relatively uh, new that are uh, totally underexploited. And one of the problems with free trade agreements is it's good for countries to sign it, but it's businesses that trade. And, um, and the CETA agreement with Europe and the TPP agreement with, uh, uh, with uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, countries, you know, uh, in both cases, we better start pulling up our socks and, uh, and doing work there. Thank you. I have a question from Giaz and would invite you to unmute and ask if you'd like still. Hello. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm uh, Jelidi and uh, I'm a university senator. Also, I'm a student member of uh, Canada uh, International Council and I just saw uh, Wonder like uh, what if um China they do not have foreign currency anymore due to the Hong Kong issue because Hong Kong is a a very very a, a important tool for China to get foreign currency. So but right now Trump they are going to um end it their special policy towards Hong Kong. So, so that will result in China do not have foreign currency anymore. So I just wanted would our Saskatchewan farmers um, accept a Chinese currency if they do not have like US dollar or Canadian dollar anymore. That's, that's it. Ed, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> you want that, to respond? Brilliant. I'm sorry, if you give it to me again, I could try, but I'm not too sure I caught it all. The, the question, uh, Ed is um, given what's going on, given that Hong Kong has oftentimes been the, the window into the Chinese market, particularly from a financial or capital point of view, it, uh, if uh, this, you know, if um, Chinese control over Hong Kong is strengthened um, and uh, there becomes restrictions on foreign capital entering the country, what will that mean? Uh, for Canada, Canadian exporters, Saskatchewan exporters, and so on. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. I mean, um, if a Chinese do not have foreign currency, so would our Saskatchewan farmer accept Chinese currency <laughs> after that? Well, I, I, go ahead, Ed. No, no, Sean, please. I was just going to say, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. It's a really good question. I, I, I don't purport to be an expert on the kind of nuances and intricacies of um, currency exchange uh, with respect to China. What I just would say, and this reinforces a point that's been made a couple of times now, is that um, China and the U.S. Uh, represent um, 
you know, north of 60% of, of total trade with Canada. There are first and third largest trading partners, as Zed says, uh, um, on a trajectory to be our, our first and our second. Um, and it's never a good thing when your first and second largest trading partners are uh, admits uh, uh, what Fareed Zakaria has called the transition from a, 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 a cold war to a hot war. Um, and, you know, that context has only reinforced um, our thinking on the need for a greater focus on, on, on Canada's industrial capacities, a greater emphasis on national interest. And um, uh, the, the, the questioner uh, mentioned that he's involved in the CIC, uh, which is a wonderful organization. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that um, Ed uh, actually, in a previous life, produced a report uh, for the CIC uh, called Open Canada that um, I'd encourage people to go back and read it. You know, uh, a lot has happened since that report has come out, but, um, um, but it has remarkable staying power. And I think, you know, if there's one core idea in Ed's report, setting aside the various policy recommendations, is that Canada has a national interest. We ought to be debating what our national interest is. Uh, and then we ought to be focused uh, a, a, as a country, and particularly at the level of public policy, on advancing our national interest. These ought not to be controversial ideas, um, but I think because of our reliance on the United States, um, because of our deep commitment to the small L liberal international trading system, we've just taken for granted for a long time um, that, our, that we need not be uh, hyper-focused on our national interests. And I think if there's one takeaway uh, from Ed's work with the CIC and, and, and the extent to which it's shaped our thinking in this new paper is that um, no one else is going to look out for Canada's national interest. We need to do that. And, um, you know, I, I think it would be a very constructive debate at the uh, Johnson Shyama School um, to think about what that national interest is. Um, obviously, in a pluralistic society, there's competing views about that. Um, but that's precisely the kind of conversation we need to be having as a country. And then operationalizing that in, in a strategy, um, precisely because, as the, as the student rightly observed, um, you know, the, the, the global... Um, the, the, the global system is increasingly uh, unstable and, and um, as the China Hong Kong experience has, has, has recently demonstrated. Uh, uh, let me just um, endorse very much what Sean said, other, other, other than the uh, quality of, uh, of, uh, of, of the report, which I'll leave him to judge, uh, uh, to judge on his own. You know, I, I, um, I'm just thinking as he talks about the Johnson Chayama School that I actually, you know, had the good fortune in life to, uh, to meet and speak with both Al Johnson and, and Tommy Chayama and uh, and learn some things uh, uh, from them uh, from them both and I think the challenge that uh, that Sean lays down is is an important challenge particularly for policy thinkers in Saskatchewan because of your um, uh, prominent position in, in global export markets you know we really are in a jam in Canada and we're not thinking about it a lot I mean I talked about you know the market access issues we have and then there's market access issues uh, um, obstacles that we create for ourselves. And this is happening in the context post COVID-19, you know, where we've been running a current account deficit uh, for a number of years and the current and, and our oil export earnings are about to decline. Uh, they'll decline on price, they'll decline on volume. Um, David Dodge was before a Senate committee recently and he pointed out that uh, oil um, last year brought in $76 billion net to Canada's current account, which covered uh, virtually all of, uh, uh, all of our major uh, consumer and travel um, imports and, uh, and, and, and foreign expenditures, more than, more, than, uh, more than covered it. That figure is not gonna be there. Our debt is gonna be greater. Some of that debt is gonna be owned by foreigners. We're gonna be paying more interest out of the country than we are now. So we really need to, you know, I think get with the program of, of how we're going to, uh, you know, address these challenges as an exporting nation in a time, um, in a time of, uh, of some crisis for, uh, for exporting. And, you know, to Sean's point, uh, there's a piece for us here. 
uh, you know, we obviously have a strong interest in the peace and we have two highly nationalistic countries feeling insecure about one another as there's a power shift goes on in the world. And uh, I don't know what role we can play right now. The role we play is helpless, jammed in between the two of them. Uh, but uh, with other middle powers, et cetera, we need to, you know, be affecting, uh, affecting policy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree with you because I hear like uh, um, Canada, they have a eighty percent of a uh, export to the United States, only a very small amount to China. But China still is the uh, second largest, but compared to United States, uh, it's that uh, in the United States far more higher than China. It's about eighty percent at this time. Yeah, well, we're, we, we are the most trade dependent uh, major economy in the world. I mean, the UK, as they're coming out of um, the EU, has about 50% of its exports to uh, the European Union. And Canada, I think last year, the figure was 74% of our exports uh, uh, went to the United States. So, you know, we have made ourselves, uh, you know, extremely reliant. We've been very lucky for many years. That's a uh, a very buoyant market that sits next door to us and we've profited from greatly but uh but as you see in the oil industry particularly you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket well thank you all very much i hate to say this on that note i'm afraid we've come to the end of our time this afternoon i think this is such an important discussion and it could go on uh, for much longer so i'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us thank you to the three panelists your insights uh, were tremendously interesting and obviously have spurred a lot of interest among our group today so thank you again uh, for coming to join us this afternoon for um, participants in the room, if you enjoyed this, you may be interested in another of our public lecture series coming up this Thursday, which looks at a path uh, to the vaccine for COVID-19. And you can find the registration details and information on the JSGS website in the events calendar. So I would encourage you to check that out as well. And now please uh, join me. You can use the reactions uh, function or type in the chat function if you prefer, but in thanking our panelists again for their, their time and their insights today. So with that, I will bring uh, today's presentation to a close with my thanks again to all of you and wishes for a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.